Good morning. Welcome to Central Presbyterian Church. We'd like to welcome any visitors that we have with us this morning. If you will, please take a moment to pass the ritual of friendship pad down your pew. That way we can have a record of your attendance today as well as a record of any visitors that we've had with us. Um, there is a place for you to mark there if you are a visitor that would like more information about becoming a member of the church. There are a lot of important announcements in the bulletin today, so if please take time to read through the bulletin. I'm going to highlight a few things for you. This year, instead of uh, having um, an Advent wreath workshop, um, the church has decided instead to sell a book, um, a special Advent book called The Wonder of the Greatest Gift by Ann Boskamp. It has an Advent calendar as well as a devotion book that you can follow along with your family during this season. The books are being offered for $20. There is a limited number of books available. If you're interested, they will be um, available for purchase after worship or in the church office. Our annual Thanksgiving offering for Thornwell Children's Home will um, be received this morning. There are envelopes in the pews. Um, if you are if you would like to participate in this offering, please make your check payable to Central Presbyterian Church, but designate in the memo that is for Thornwell. PYC is doing something new. Um, they are preparing pa uh, casseroles to sell to you. There are three different casseroles that the youth will be preparing. Um, you can order these. There are order forms available in the Narthax. It's actually a green order sheet. The orders need to be received by next Sunday, December 1st. This is a great way that you can have an easy meal ready, a home-picked meal ready to just pop in the oven one night during this busy holiday season. So please take advantage of that. Plus, we get to put our kids to work, so it's great. <laughs> um, the mission committee is requesting homemade desserts for the soup kitchen's Thanksgiving. If you're able to make some desserts, please bring them to the church office by 10 o'clock on Tuesday, November 26th. We are, um, the church is currently selling port poinsettias. There is a plate, an order form in the bulletin if you would like to place an order. And last of all, please keep the people beneath the steeple um, in your prayers this week. We have a lot of people in our church that are currently ill or have a lot lots of things going on um, and also just our church in general just please keep all of our congregation in your prayers at this time of the year
Please stand and join me in the call to worship. O oh God of greatness and goodness, not only did you set us apart from the rest of creation, but you made us in your own image. O oh Lord, give us grateful hearts and let us rejoice in the presence of our Creator. O oh God of might and mercy, not only did you follow your people into the far country, but you took up the cross to set them free. O oh Lord, give us grateful hearts and let us rejoice in the presence of our Redeemer. O oh God of consolation and comfort, not only did you bring us together in one place, but you called us to be your witnesses. O oh Lord, give us grateful hearts and let us rejoice in the presence of your sustainer. Gracious God, you have revealed yourself to us in more ways than we can recall or recount. Give us grateful hearts and let us rejoice in the love that will never let us go. Let us worship God. sanctuaries today, yet not confined by physical structure, make your power known in our worship. As we call upon you for forgiveness and mercy, may we be assured of your mercy and pardon. Hear us now as we pray. O God of all, may we be reminded that we cannot contain or define your majesty or limit your power to what we know and understand. Forgive us when we have made you smaller to enhance our comfort, when we have attempted to hold you back because we are not ready. 
You crash into our sanctuaries, into our worship, into our lives, whether we are ready or not. You refuse to wait any longer. May we stand aside or be caught up in your wake as you weave your way through the world, changing the lives of all your people with the power of love. Amen. Do not weep. See, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has tri triumphed. With his blood, he has purchased people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Friends, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. At this time, I'd like to invite the children to come forward. Morning. How y'all doing? How's it going, Ben? We're a children. You're coming forward, too? <laughs> yeah, you're coming, too. You got all the handbook wire coming. I know. Ouch. Big crowd. What's up, Dennis? Jacket looks good. I think we're going to have to add more steps. Good morning. I hope you all are doing good. I want to share a little story with you all today. I want to share a story about a little boy and his lost book. At the beginning of our story, the little boy is only going to be eight years old. So if you're here and you're eight years old, raise your hand. Yeah, so he's just about as old as you guys right now. Although this boy was very young, he was also a king. King Josiah became a king at such a young age because his dad, King Amon, was doing some very, very bad things. So bad that the people turned against him and killed him. Josiah's granddad had also been a king. And like Joseph's, uh, Josiah's father, his granddad was doing some bad things too. He had turned away from God by building idols and temples to false gods. During King Manasseh's rule, that's Josiah's granddad, the book of law was not being used, was eventually lost. This book was God's special message to his people and was supposed to be read to the people every day. Without the book, the people would not learn how to live as God wanted them to. So Josiah's dad and his granddad had been bad kings, but Josiah was going to be different. Josiah dedicated his life to God. And he started off by ridding the kingdom of all the idols and the temples that his granddad had built. And this work took a long time, so by the time it was done, he was a young man. He wasn't a little boy anymore. After he was done with this work, he prayed and thought about what he was going to do next. He decided he was going to rebuild the temple. But Josiah wasn't a builder, so he thought how he could help. So he took a lot of his money and he gave it to builders and told them they could use it however they wanted to rebuild the temple. And other people saw this, and they were inspired, and they gave money too, and eventually the temple was rebuilt. As the builders were working on the temple, they found an old dusty book laying around, and they took a look at it, and they thought it was important. So they took it to Josiah, and Josiah realized that this was the book of laws that God had given his people. Uh, when he realized how important this book was and that his granddad and his dad 
not been using it, he was embarrassed and sad. So he declared that the book of law was going to be used the way God had intended. So he called all the people of Jerusalem together to meet. At this gathering, he read the book of law for everyone to hear. And then he promised to follow and keep God's law with all of his heart and all of his soul. The people gathered there that day were inspired. And they made that same promise to follow and keep God's law with all of their heart and all of their soul. So our story doesn't end there, but we're going to stop there for a So I'm going to get you all to take a second, think back about our story about Josiah, and how did he become a positive influence and help lead people towards God. All right, now take another second and think about somebody in your life who's a positive influence and helps lead you towards God. All right, let us pray. Lord, in this time of thanksgiving, thank you for your word and the light it provides us to know and follow your will with all of our heart and all of our soul. Thank you for sacrificing your son so that we forgiven our sins. And thank you for putting people in our lives that have a positive influence on us and lead us towards you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, if you're heading down to Children's Church, you can line up at the door. If not, you can head back to sit down with your parents. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Eternal God, in the reading of the scripture, may your word be heard. In the meditations of our hearts, may your word be known. And in the faithfulness of our lives, may your word be shown. Amen.
many thanks to all who have participated in leading in worship today musically. Mandy, it's a constant source of amazement to me, the things that you are able to pull off and the way you lead this church in worship with people of all ages. Many thanks to you for your wonderful efforts. With following the narrative lectionary, this is one of those days that the scripture is a little out of sync with the day that we're observing. This is Christ the King Sunday, so we're celebrating the Lordship of Christ in all things, but we're still in the Old Testament. And yet, as Marshall so beautifully told the story, we are looking at a king who, in opposition to all that was going on around him and before him, put God at the center of his life and his nation's life, so that's a good reminder for us in how we are to, to look at Christ as being the center of our lives today. So once again, hearing the story of Josiah from chapters 22 and 23 of 2 Kings. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. He reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedida, daughter of Adiah of Bozkoth. Now, Marshall, you fact check me on those names. <laughs> he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right or to the left. In the 18th year of King Josiah, the king sent Shaphan, son of Azaliah, the son of Meshullam, the secretary, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to the high priest Hilkiah and have him count the entire sum of the money that has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the threshold have collected from the people. Let it be given into the hand of the workers who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. Let them give it to the workers who are at the house of the Lord repairing the house, that is, to the carpenters, to the builders, to the masons, and let them use it to buy timber and quarried stone to repair the house. But no accounting shall be asked from them for the money that is delivered into their hand, for they deal honestly. The high priest Hilkiah said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. When Hilkiah took, gave the book to Shaphan, he read it. Then Shaphan the secretary came to the king and reported to the king, Your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workers who have oversight of the house of the Lord. Shaphan the secretary informed the king, The priest Hilkiah has given me a book. Shaphan then read it aloud to the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Now we skip over to the beginning of chapter 23, the king's response. The king directed that all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem should be gathered to him. The king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him went all the people of Judah, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests, the prophets, and all the people, both small and great, he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord, keeping his commandments, his decrees, and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people joined in the covenant. May God bless the reading and the hearing of this portion of the scriptures. Well, this was 500 years after the exodus from Egypt, and it was 600 years before the birth of the Messiah. Israel's golden age under Kings David and Solomon was 300 years in the rearview mirror. Civil war had split the country in two, the northern kingdom of Israel had recently been defeated by the Assyrians and the Assyrian army was now knocking on the door of the southern kingdom of Judah. Both of the kingdoms had suffered under poor leadership which was marked by weakness, unfaithfulness to God, corruption in government, 
and looking to other nations for help in various ways. Some of the kings had married foreign princesses for political alliances. They'd started worshiping their gods and building temples for those gods. Others initiated military alliances with foreign countries or even paid blackmail money, in essence, to keep other nations from invading them. The kings were powerful within their own countries and they had massive egos. The priest from generation to generation came to understand that in order to keep their jobs, they needed to preach the party line. In other words, whatever the king said or wanted was the truth. If the king said it was time to go to war, then the priest needed to find a way to justify that from God's perspective. If the king said it was time to raise taxes, the priest needed to support that call. And so the scriptures were literally and figuratively packed away for a time in Israel because the scriptures couldn't be counted on to proclaim the party line. The book was lost and the people were like sheep without a shepherd, wandering around without the biblical vision to sustain them. And the God who had delivered the children of Israel from the powerful Pharaoh of Egypt with a mighty hand and had brought them safely through a perilous wilderness to give them a promised land in which to live had also sort of been stored away along with the Ark of the Covenant in the Temple of Jerusalem and forgotten. The temple was fall, allowed to fall into disrepair. New worship centers were built in high places for the worship of the new foreign gods whose adherents had come into the country. The kings were largely responsible for the way things changed and they were judged very harshly by the few prophets of the true God who remained faithful and were willing to oppose the king and challenge the status quo. But the story of Judah leading up to the exile is not an unbroken line of unfaithful and wicked kings. Hezekiah was a reasonably good king and his great-grandson Josiah made a remarkable last-ditch attempt to return the kingdom of Judah to a godly path and avoid the coming judgment. Though he was not ultimately successful, it is important for those of us who are cynics, who think that once things start deteriorating, there's no way to turn it around. It's important for us to hear stories like this. Josiah was only eight years old, like some of these children sitting at the front when he became the king. His father Ammon had re reigned only two years before he was killed in his own house by his own servants. Ammon is judged very harshly by the Bible for idol worship and for abandoning the Lord of Israel. Whenever a child becomes king, it is extremely important who the people are who become mentors and teachers and advisors for this child king. And Josiah obviously had some good ones and people who nurtured faith in God and wise leadership. He reigned over Judah for 31 years. And after his death, the Babylonian exile began only 12 years later. After Josiah had been king for 18 years, he authorized that all the money that had been collected in the temple should be used for restoring the temple and refurbishing it. This is the story which I read this morning. He sent his secretary to inform the high priest Hilkiah about this work so that it could begin. And while the secretary was there, Hilkiah pulled out a scroll, it's not a book like we have, it was a scroll, and he said, tell Josiah that I found the book of the law. And the secretary took the scroll back to the king to see. You see the book of the law, probably the book of Deuteronomy, had been lost, maybe not literally lost, but figuratively. My guess is that the priest Hilkiah knew exactly where it was when he took advantage of this opportunity to find it. It had been put on the back shelf or the bottom drawer. 
It had fallen into disfavor before the other gods kings chose to worship who did not ask as much of them. It had fallen into disuse by priests who were afraid to challenge the king. And finally, it had been tucked away into a vault or a jar or who knows where so that one day it could be found again. So when Josiah ordered the temple cleaned up and renovated, it was a perfect opportunity for it to be found and delivered to him. And when the secretary read it to him, it became something remembered for Josiah. It retold to King Josiah the story of his people, the story of the mighty God who made his people into something. And when Josiah heard the story, he knew He knew instinctively that it was true, and he was filled with sorrow because he could see just how far his nation and his people had strayed from their God. Have you ever had an experience like King Josiah had when he was read the book of the law and remembered, though he was really too young to actually remember, the story of his people and learned something really important from the experience? Here's the kind of thing I'm thinking about. A few years ago, I went to a funeral. Yeah, I do that a lot. I wasn't conducting this funeral. I was just attending. It was the mother of one of my church members. I got there early because I wasn't sure where I was going. It was a very old church, a pre-Revolutionary War church. had a cemetery. It was a pretty day, so I decided to walk around the cemetery for a bit before going inside. What an eye-opening experience. I was reminded of the ways in which life has changed since the founding of our country. Almost all of the very, very old tombstones had at least one child's death recorded on it. Many had more. I came across one tombstone for a couple which had experienced the deaths of five children varying in ages from infancy to 17. I was no longer that sorrowful about the funeral I had come to attend, which was for an elderly person who had lived a very full life, and I found myself overwhelmed with grief for a family which I knew nothing about except that they had lost five children to death. Reading and learning about history comes alive when you can enter into the story in some way and empathize with what the people in that history have experienced. In just the last hundred years of our country's existence, we can learn about and remember times when people were willing to give their lives or those of their loved ones for a cause they believed was worth it in defending their freedom. A world where people not only gave up the luxuries of life, but even endured rationing of necessities in order that the good of all be advanced. We can remember a time when people risked beating or being jailed or even being killed to march in the streets for freedom and rights and to shelter potential victims of the Holocaust. We can remember a world where people could lose four or five children and somehow not go crazy or commit suicide, or abandon their faith. When this kind of scroll is found and read, it rings true, and hopefully the remembering of the history, even though we may not have been alive ourselves to participate in it, can change our lives. Reading about the Civil War, the World Wars, the Holocaust, the Vietnam War, the Civil Rights Movement, and many more things have all had that kind of impact on me. But none as much as reading the Bible. And that's astonishing to me, given that the book is as old as it is and comes from a land so far removed geographically, politically, and culturally from where I live. But the scriptures speak to me vividly. It awakens all kinds of memories and longings within me. As people of faith, I think the Bible serves as our book of collective memories. And as we join it with our own experiential memories, there's untold power present. Let me tell you about how King Josiah's story ends. 
Josiah asked the priest Hilkiah to inquire of the Lord about his fate and about the fate of his country. Interestingly, the priest went to a woman, a prophetess named Huldah, and asked her the answer to that question. She sent word to Josiah that the Lord was still going to bring disaster upon Judah because of its wickedness but that because of Josiah's faithfulness, it would not happen until after his death. Think about how Josiah could have responded to that. He could have said, well, it doesn't matter what I do then. I don't need to try that hard. Things are gonna be okay while I'm alive and the next person can worry about it. I'll punt it down the road. We see plenty of that attitude, but that's not what Josiah did. In spite of the judgment that he was told was coming, he did something positive. He called an assembly of all the people. He personally read the law out loud to them. And when he finished reading, he personally renewed a covenant between himself and God and gave all the rest of the people the opportunity to do so as well. This was an act of humility and submission by Josiah showing his intention to put God back at the center of his life and calling his nation to do the same. I can imagine being there in the crowd that day, hearing the story of my great, 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 great grandmothers and grandfathers for the first time, really, read from a book which rings with truth and holiness, read by no less a person than my king. Imagine as he got to the end of the book, the end of the story, and reached the climax of it, reading these stirring words spoken by Moses. Now what I'm commanding you today is not too difficult for you. It's not beyond your reach. It's not way up in heaven so that you have to ask, who can go to heaven and get it for us and come back and tell us about it so that we can obey it? Nor is it on the other side of the ocean so that you have to ask, who can go across the ocean for us and get it and bring it back and teach us about it so that we can obey it? No, the word is very near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart so that you can obey it. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. I command you today to love the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his commands, decrees, and laws, and then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you're not obedient, if you're drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, then I declare to you this day, you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you're crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. So this day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. So choose life so that you and your children may live, that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers. Last note, as I mentioned earlier, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem happened just 12 years after Josiah's death, with many of the people of Judah taken into exile in Babylon. We've talked throughout this fall about much of the Old Testament being compiled during the exile in order to keep the story alive, allow people to keep hearing it and remembering it, and in order to teach it to a new generation born there in Babylon. You can imagine the importance of a story like Josiah's, a king who was willing to buck the trend of unfaithfulness in order to lead his people in turning back to God. I think the moral of the story for exiles would have been that one person can make a big difference, but that difference has to be followed through on and sustained for the long haul in order to truly make a difference. 
And we'll see in the next few weeks that this learning did make a difference, some good results and some not so good. Ultimately, the bottom line is that Josiah was not the shoot from the stump of Jesse who would turn the world around and usher in a new era as we looked at last week. And yet he was a point of light, a sign of hope, a beacon of faithfulness, who even today across all of the centuries can invite all of us into a renewed covenant relationship of gratitude for God's mighty acts and grateful response through the giving of our lives in the service of God. Each day we too are invited to choose who we will serve. May we choose wisely. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we respond to God's call in our lives, I invite you to begin that response as we stand together and join in saying the Apostles' Creed, our affirmation of faith. Together, let, let us affirm what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
may be seated. Would you please join me in prayer? God, we are thankful to you for this beautiful day and for your many blessings to us, for your provisions in all of life. Thank you for our families, for our church, our community, our nation, and the world we live in. Pray your presence with the leaders in each of those areas. Pray your guidance and direction, protection, and wisdom for them all. We do, as we prepare to enter into the season of Advent next week, uh, continue to yearn for the coming of the Savior into the world uh, for the first time and for the second time. We ask that you'll strengthen our faith and our resolve to live for you despite how the rest of the world chooses to live. We ask today that you'll be with those who are discouraged, those who are in hospital, rehab hospitals, nursing homes, hospice houses. Pray for their families as well, and we pray for their doctors and nurses and caregivers. Pray your presence with each one, that your healing presence will be known and your loving and caring presence be known. We offer our prayer for all those who will be traveling this holiday week and ask for safe journeys and glad reunions with families. We pray that you'll be at work through all of the things that we do to try to, to reach out to those who are less fortunate, that you use those efforts to make life brighter for people who are struggling now. We ask that you'll lift our hearts to you and open our hearts to them. We ask these and all of our prayers together in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, let us continue to worship God as stewards of what we have been given, presenting God's tithes and our offerings and our gifts for the Thornwell Children's Home to the Lord.
God, we thank you for blessing us so abundantly with every kind of gift. We thank you for gifts both material and spiritual, for gifts musical and for all the varied expressions of that. We ask that you'll take all of our gifts that we've offered to you this day and multiply them and use them for the work of your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace both now and in the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to please be seated for the choral response today. <laughs> 